Hello, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center Livable Communities webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled The Power of 25, Advocacy Strategies for Creating Livable Communities with Peter Loggerway, Senior Transportation Planner at Tool Design Group. My name is Jeremy Pinkham, and I am the Communication Coordinator for PBIC and the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I'd first like to say that hello to today's speaker and make sure he's ready and everyone can hear him. Peter, are you with me? I'm with you. Okay, great. Uh, attendees, if you can hear me and if you can hear Peter, Click the hand in the box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to raise your hand so we can be sure our audience can hear us. Okay, we're getting some hands raised. That's, that's a great sign. Uh, if for some reason your computer or web browser freezes during the webinar, please reload the website and log back into the program. You'll be able to rejoin the session. Before we get started with today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar software. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. We do expect a large number of attendees on this call, so by muting your audio, it helps us to cut down on confusion and background noise. Though you won't be able to speak, you will have the ability to ask questions. Let's take a look at this slide that shows the webinar interface. As an attendee, you have a control box in the upper right hand of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking this arrow button right here. The control gives you the option of how you will listen to the webinar, either over voice over IP or by dialing into the conference call number. If you are dialing in over the phone, you need to enter your unique PIN provided in this area. In the control box, there's also a place to enter questions. If you have a problem during the webinar, you may enter it there. As the facilitator, I'll monitor these questions as they come in and respond to you if I am able. Questions pertaining to the actual subject matter of this program may be asked at any time in the question box, but will not be addressed until the end of the program, when we have built in about 25 minutes for a discussion period. Please feel free to ask those questions as we go along, and we'll get to them after the presentation. Now we'll look at today's program. Um, before I get started, I want to give everyone a little bit of information about what this webinar is about. The Livable Communities webinar series was developed by the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, the National Clearinghouse of Pedestrian and Bicycle Related Safety, Information, and Resources. We offer information and, te and technical assistance to diverse audiences about health and safety, engineering, advocacy, education, enforcement, access, and mobility as it relates to pedestrians and bicyclists. PBIC and today's webinar are both made possible with funding from the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Highway Administration. The goal of the Livable Communities webinar series is to better enable our audience to improve the quality of life in their communities by promoting safe walking and bicycling as a viable means of transportation and physical activity. Webinars are typically held on a bi-monthly basis. Uh, the next Livable Communities webinar will be held on Thursday, January 21st, 2010, from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be presented by Charlie Zagir, our director here at PBIC. Sigir will speak on selection of pedestrian treatments at unsignalized crossings, and the registration link can be found at walkinginfo.org slash webinars. Shortly after the, uh, the webinar today, we'll have that link posted. There you will also be able to access an archive recording and transcript of today's program after the live webinar. It usually takes about a week for us to get that posted. Uh, in addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and improving conditions for walking. In fact, some of the content from today's presentation is drawn from the one-day course, Creating Livable Communities Through Public Involvement. These courses can be found at walkinginfo.org slash training. If we are not able to get to your question at the end of the presentation, please do not hesitate to contact us. All of our web resources can be accessed at pedbikeinfo.org, and you may reach me at any time at webinars at hsrc.unc.edu or by calling 919-843-4859. If you do not get all of that down, this information will be posted again at the end of today's webinar. And finally, um, if you are interested in learning more about advocacy, PBIC is proud to be partnering with Easter Seals Project Action to co-present a free webinar on this topic on December 9th. The webinar is titled, Getting There Together, Supporting Accessible, Sustainable Transportation in Your Community, and is part of Easter Seals Project Action's Promising Practices and Solutions in Accessible Transportation series. 
During this webinar, Penny Everline, Training and Technical Assistance spe Specialist, will discuss how communities can use a new, simple two-hour curriculum called Getting There Together to bring together diverse audiences to learn about the benefits of and how to support accessible and sustainable transportation options. PBIC Director Charlie Zagir will also be on hand to share resources and training relevant to pedestrian access and connectivity to transit. This one-hour program will be at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, December 9th. We will have information posted on PBIC site to let you know how to register for the webinar. We will also provide a link where you can download the Getting There Together curriculum. Uh, now I'm going to turn the screen over to Peter Lagerway for the future presentation on the power uh, on the power of 25. While he's getting set up with a slide presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Okay. Um, Peter Lagerway is the Seattle Regional Office Director for Tool Design Group and was formerly the Pedestrian and Bicycle Program Coordinator for the City of Seattle for more than 20 years. Peter has taught courses on pedestrian and bicycle safety in over 200 cities. Most recently, he led the effort to create the new Seattle Bicycle Master Plan, a planning document that will be used to guide future improvements to Seattle's bicycle network. He is also an author of How to Develop a Pedestrian Safety Action Plan, which can be found right on the homepage of walkinginfo.org. And I'd like to welcome and thank Peter for his presentation today. Uh, we'll take questions at the end. And I uh, see uh, Peter's just pulling up his um, slideshow now. Are you all set to go, Peter? No, I, I don't see the slideshow. Um, OK. Is it, is it there for folks? Uh, yes. Yep, I see it. OK, great. OK, well, welcome, everyone, and, and thank you for joining the webinar. And thank you, Jamie, uh, for that wonderful introduction. The, power, uh, the uh, topic of today's presentation, the Power of 25 Strategies for Creating Livable Communities. First of all, a, a quick outline of what I'm going to be presenting. Uh, number one, uh, why public involvement? Number two, I'm going to talk about different organizational models for public in involvement. Uh, number three, and that's really the, the bulk of what I'll be talking about, is the power of 25 strategies for creating livable communities. And then finally, institutionalizing change. I would, I would also just mention that um, uh, usually I present this, this uh, workshop or a variation of it uh, in a pure lecture format. So it doesn't have a, a lot of a whiz and bang in terms of the, the, the PowerPoint. Uh, but I, I think it will work just fine, and I would encourage you to also take notes. So I've, I've just got a screen here that says uh, public involvement, the con common denominator of successful communities. And the reason I put this up is that it, it really provided me with a motivation for putting this together. Um, in the last 12 years, I've had the opportunity to be uh, at about 200 different communities. And uh, the good news is, is that in most communities, the, uh, there's some really good things going on when it comes to walking and bicycling. And uh, just about every community has some new development going on. It has some really walkable areas that have been created. Uh, it has some wonderful bike facilities that have put, been put in. But usually it's in a little piece of the community. Typically, uh, you don't see it in the whole thing. So there are some communities that are getting the entire thing right. And one of the things I've always been curious about and have given a lot of thought to is, why do some communities over time, uh, why are they able to sustain an ongoing effort to really fundamentally change their community and create a great, walkable, livable, bikeable community in other communities, they're sort of start and stop. Uh, they do it on a little bit by bit basis. And the one common denominator that I have found is that the communities that are getting it right over time have figured out how to do public involvement. And that means that they've figured out how to involve the public on an ongoing institutionalized way so that the public involvement uh, is transcends the uh, changing of administrations, the changing of mayors, the changing of city council people, uh, the, the changing of, uh, of departmental directors, 
Uh, those things are a revolving door. And because of that, I think there's the problem of sustainability in terms of, of a really an ongoing effort because it does take a number of years to create a walkable and bikeable community. And, and so really I think the public involvement uh, sector and part of this really provides that continuity, that, that connector that, that helps it to continue to go year after year. A lot of people ask, well, why public involvement? And I'm just going to go, I've got four reasons here, but I'm going to skip right to the bottom one first. It's required by law. And to some extent, that's the least compelling reason to have public involvement. And we've all been to public involvement meetings where you put up a mic, and because it's required by law, uh, you invite some people, they all talk. Uh, there's a general sense that their comments are ignored. People go home and it's not a very good feeling and people don't feel very listened to. So yes, we do it because it's required by law, but if that's all we do, we're not going to get very far. I'm going to go back up to the top one, a better product. One of the things that I've noticed, uh, both working in government and outside of government, is that there is a lack of belief within the planning and engineering transportation community that public involvement creates a better product. And if you don't believe that, the public immediately picks up on that and they feel, again, like, well, we're just going through the motions required by law. And one of the things I've learned over time is that while well, public involvement can be painful and while well, public involvement does produce ideas that aren't necessarily the best sometimes, it also, um, at the end of the day, is the only way to get a better product. We are not going to get bikeable, walkable communities on a sustained level without public involvement. I would add one more antidote here is that uh, always think of, of when you're looking at a better product, two parts to it. One is problem identification and one is problem solution. And where the public is particularly good is identifying the problem. They know if their child can't get across the street to go to the school. They know if they can't walk to the grocery store because there's a no sidewalk. They know those things and the public is very good at identifying them. The second reason for public involvement, and I've already uh, alluded to this, and that's sustainability and momentum. The, the, uh, like I mentioned before, is that, that um, to sustain and maintain that, that commitment to fundamentally changing the infrastructure requires many, many years, and, and public involvement for, uh, creates those links so that it can happen. The third one, and I think this one's really, really important, and this is what I'm going to call the social contract. Our customers are the citizens. They provide the funding. And in the long run, they're not going to want to pay the taxes. They're not going to want to provide the funding if they don't believe their government is working for them. And one of the things that I've noticed over time is that when there are surveys done to look at um, what communities want from their transportation, and you do community plans, uh, and you look at those surveys, you find that what people want and what government is doing quite often are completely at different ends of the spectrum. And there's a sense, I think, sometimes from government that we know best, and uh, that's what we're going to do. And of course, if you don't listen, uh, if you violate that social contract, then in the long run, people are not going to want to continue to fund government and do the things that we want to do. And uh, uh, you know, just in, in strictly in the interest of survival and providing transportation services, we need to listen and provide the kind of transportation infrastructure that the public wants. I think sometimes there's sort of an arrogance that says, we know better. And in the long run, it simply doesn't work. So what are the organizational models for public involvement? And I'm going to um, suggest five different models here. I've starred number two because that's what I'm going to talk about most today. But I'm also going to touch on each one of them. Number one, government-sponsored boards and commissions. So that's where the, the government, in some way, uh, appoints people. Number two, advocacy groups. That's what I'll talk about more a little later on. Number three, neighborhood-based community organizations. These are the geographically-based uh, neighborhood groups. Uh, four, 
private sector organizations. These are your public, private, not-for-profit organizations. And then number five, individuals. And the communities that get it right and sustain it over time um, are effective in each one of these five areas. So I'll just touch on each one. Government-sponsored boards and commissions. And I'm going to circle back to this a little bit later because uh, there's lots and lots of examples. But um, I've listed here two basic types. Uh, one would be advisory. And that would be like a bicycle advisory board or a pedestrian advisory board. Or it could be a project-specific committee. For example, in Seattle, when we did our bicycle master plan, we formed a citizens committee that started with the start of that project and then ended with the end of that project. They were advisory. And then there are regulatory um, uh, government-sponsored boards and commissions. An example would be a planning commission or a zoning commission. These are, these are boards and commissions that uh, make decisions that have regulatory authority. So what they say happens. Uh, so just I like to think in terms of two different kinds, kinds under this category. Uh, number two is advocacy groups. And I show this little picture here of the Cascade Bike Club, the uh, local club in Seattle here. Um, these are calling special interest groups in the best sense of the word of special interest. And what I mean by that is, is where uh, people get together because they have a, a common cause or a common campaign, common interest, where they are advocating for something in particular. And so if you have a bicycle group or a pedestrian group that's advocating for something, this would be an example of an advocacy special interest group. And I'm going to come back, obviously, and talk more about that in a minute. Number three, these are neighborhood-based uh, organizations. And they're geographically based. In other words, to be a member of, the, of one of these organizations, you have to either live in the community or do business in the community. And an example would be a neighborhood uh, association or a chamber of commerce. Um, in Seattle, just to use an example, we have 38 different neighborhood associations. And then pretty much each neighborhood area has their own neighborhood commercial area with their own chamber of commerce, something like that. And again, to be part of these, you need to either live in that area or you need to have a business in that area. So they can be advocacy groups also, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind that's more geographically based. I'm just going to go into a little antidote here just to reinforce an earlier point. Uh, a number of years ago in Seattle, uh, we did 38 neighborhood plans. Three of them were industrial areas, no, no, no residential. So the 35 neighborhood areas, each of them that did the neighborhood plan, uh, when they developed their own plan, Every single one of them um, mentioned the importance of something related to pedestrian safety. It doesn't mean they saw themselves as pedestrian advocates, but they all identified places they wanted sidewalks or streets they wanted to cross or things like that. The interesting thing was that virtually none of them addressed the issue of capacity, congestion, level of service, it simply wasn't on the radar screen. And again, it was one of those glaring examples, I think, sometimes of what we in the transportation world think are the most important transportation issues and an example of what the neighborhood folks I think are the most important transportation issues. So again, uh, what we really all need to be doing is a better job of listening. Number four, um, individuals. and. Uh, I don't know how many of you just saw the recent recent series on our national parks that was on, on public television. But one of the things that struck me when I watched it, when they went through Yellowstone and um, Yosemite and, and all the different great parks in our nation and talked about the history of it and how it became a national park, in every single case, from what I could tell, there was a, a champion, somebody who made it their passion to number three on the list here, made it their passion, and in some cases their life's work, to make that national park happen. And um, I have found the same with uh, things in the bicycling and walking area. Uh, don't underestimate uh, the incredible importance of champions. Um, when you look at a, a rail trail conversion, usually there's one, two, three, four champions that just absolutely work on it. 
uh, when we see a, a really walkable neighborhood, it just is fantastic. There's usually a couple of individuals who champion that. So, um, you know, nurture, develop, encourage, support your champions. So other kinds of individuals, um, let's go to the top here, spokespeople for a larger group. Um, this, this could be uh, uh, any number of communities. I have found that when there are communities where there are uh, not a, a lot of English-speaking people, for example, that may be a place to look for a spokesperson, but we're really anywhere. Um, that's the, one of the kind of individuals you want to work with. Uh, individual power brokers. And uh, these could be people who have a lot of influence in the community, uh, either just of their own personal will, or maybe they, they uh, own a lot of businesses and property in the area, but, but people who are listened to within the local political structure. And then, and then the last one, uh, Lone Rangers. And uh, every community has them. I think in the bike and ped world, we, we seem to pick up these folks too. Um, they have a role to play, but they can also sometimes may or may not be uh, in tune with what the larger bicycling or walking community may want. But again, I, I like to just sort of think of this so that we have an inclusive tent and include all these different people in our thinking. So now I'm going to go back to advocacy groups and talk a little bit about the power of 25. One of the things that when I go to communities, um, I often get individuals coming up to me and they say, you know, how do we get people to listen to us? No one seems to take us seriously. Uh, we present these comments, and it, it just doesn't happen. And usually when I talk to folks, I find out that they really um, haven't done their homework to create sustainable advocacy groups that, over time, um, really can make a difference. But it does take some time, and it takes, it takes a few people. So part of the thinking behind putting this together and this is just an example, um, and I don't expect anybody to follow it exactly. But what it does do is it provides uh, a model to get going. This, this is really uh, not intended for people who are doing advocacy very, very well already, uh, may not need this. But this is for those communities that are just getting going on the advocacy and, and really want uh, some ideas and a model to go forward. Also, the thinking behind this is that I want to sort of demonstrate that it doesn't take that many people and it doesn't take that much energy to be really, really effective in terms of affecting change. So here's how I want to just talk a little bit about the commitment of two. And this, this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but the idea here is to, is to, again, give you permission to go ahead and do this and realize it doesn't take that many people it doesn't take that much effort to have an incredible impact on in your community. So let's just, for the sake of argument, assume we have 25 people and we have 50 weeks in a year. Um, we'll assume that we're two weeks off for Christmas. And you get together with 25 people and you're going to meet once a month. If you would have these 25 people all commit to spending over a period of a year two emails, which is not a lot, write two letters, which is not a lot, make two phone calls, which is not a lot, attend two meetings, again, not that much, total of eight contacts a year for each person times 25 people, that's about 200 contacts a year. So simply doing the math, about four times a week, a local decision maker will hear from your group. And one of the, one of the so, so part of the magic of this is just to demonstrate it doesn't take many people it doesn't take a lot of work. But the other big benefit from this is that you give the impression that you're everywhere. In other words, it will get over the, the, the bump, I think, or the, the feeling sometimes in a lot of communities is that there's just one, two, or three people who want to create a better place to walk or want to create a better place to bike. And the same person always shows up. Of course, if the same one or two or three people always show up at a meeting, um, after a while, everybody knows what they're going to say. Uh, they become background, background noise. And there's, I think, sometimes a tendency to tune folks out and because they become, in a way, too familiar, if you will. So one of the things I always recommend to a group is that you really want to spread it around. 
And, and so really the, the magic of 25 is to be ubiquitous. You, you really want to create this that you're everywhere. So four times a week, you're, you're having um, four times a week uh, a key decision for a department head, a mayor, an elected official, somebody is, is um, getting something from your group that's raising the issue of bicycling and walking. And you know you're successful when you move from when you really, when you move from the question of um, you know will any bicycles or pedestrians even use this to okay do we want bikes and peds here and what's the best way to accommodate the bikes and and peds so it, it when the questions start changing you know you've institutionalized it to the point where it's a, there's an assumption there's a demand for walking and biking facilities. And the, the question is, uh, is this a good place for them? And I always think the answer is going to be yes, but that will be the public discussion. And, and then how do we accommodate bikes and pets? Of course, there's some people saying, we don't want the bikes here. We don't want the pets here. That's a much better discussion to have than I don't think they exist. And so, so uh, once you change the questions, change the public discussion, you know that you're being successful. So, Making it happen, and again, uh, this, it, it, this may sound a little trite, but it, it's just a way to get you thinking, to keep people motivated. Um, one of the things that I've discovered is when you have volunteers, you really have to be purposeful about involving them on an ongoing basis. In other words, get purposeful about figuring out ways to keep them excited, motivated, involved, coming to their monthly meetings. And so it's just just a a few little little thoughts here on, on how to do that. Um, whenever you do have a meeting, um, my suggestion is you create a spreadsheet with everybody's name on it, and you just keep track um, of what emails they sent, what letters they sent, what phone messages they sent, what meetings they went to, and then do a little bring and brag round table. Um, keep it short. Keep it very short. Everybody gets 30 seconds, a minute or something. but. When people contribute to their community and donate their most precious, uh, most precious resource, which is their time, they need recognition. And one of the ways to do it on a monthly basis is have people report in. Uh, I sent a letter to so and so. Uh, I went to this meeting. I called so and so. Whatever the case may be. The other thing about just keeping meetings uh, interesting is you always want a special special guest. Um, there has to be a compelling reason to attend every meeting, and you know a guest related to a project, a program, uh, a new plan, something like that. So that if you miss that meeting, you're missing the one single best opportunity to provide input on on a particular project. And then finally, have some good food. Um, people will show up for food, so make sure it's there. And again, uh, and, and you know a lot of this is, is not new. But I also noticed that a lot of uh, advocacy groups, when they do have their meeting, don't do this. They don't give people the recognition they they need and the feedback they need for doing good work. And also, sometimes uh, the meetings can be kind of uh, not focused and have real no, no real compelling reason to be there. So the guest issue is so important. I'm going to take you to. Um, the, the next step. Um, you, you've got your group, you've got your 25, you've all committed, you've infiltrated the system, and at one point, at some point, you're going to say, okay, we want to take the next step. How do we really infiltrate the entire city, the entire county, whatever the case may be, it could be your state, um, and say, you know, what, what's the next step for placing our people people who want to promote bicycling and walking in the right places so that we really become part of the civic and public discussion of what's going on. So what I've done here is put together a list of 25 boards and commissions worth joining. And this list is just to get you thinking. Your community will be different. Um, when I was putting this presentation together, I went to the uh, City of Seattle boards and commissions, and I looked it up. And there was about 70 different boards and commissions that, in some way or another, 
um, shaped and formed what our community is. And a lot of them are in a position to, to do some great things or do some bad things for promoting bicycling and walking. And so if we had one bicycle and pedestrian advocate uh, on each one of those boards and commissions, and you want to cherry pick the ones that are most important, you don't want to just waste people's time, uh, you can make a huge difference. So I just put together uh, a list here, and I'm going to run through them just to get you thinking. <laughs> and so for each one of these, I want you to ask, would it be important in my community to have a person on this particular board or commission? And you're going to say yes to some, you're going to say no to others, and then you're going to have your own list of, you know, with slightly different names, different titles, but you're going to have your own list of things in your community that you want to be part of so that you can have a bigger impact on your community. Again, the idea is to be ubiquitous, you want to be everywhere, and you really want to institutionalize and normalize bicycling walking into the entire system. So I'll just quickly run through this list. Um, one could be a planning commission. In many cases, um, those are not just advisory, they can be regulatory in some communities. If it's regulatory, for sure you want to be there. Same with a zoning commission, uh, varying degrees of authority, but if, if it's a place that really uh, makes decisions that have regulatory authority, you want to be there. Uh, your metropolitan planning organization, your MPO, is going to have a variety of opportunities for citizen input. They may have a non-motorized committee, they may have a transportation committee. Um, most of those committees are going to have a citizen slot, and if they do, it might as well be a pedestrian or bicycle advocate. Um, in many communities, the MPOs have a fair amount of say in where the funding goes and how the, your, your region ultimately looks. I already mentioned your neighborhood, your neighborhood group. Uh, I mentioned, for example, the 38 neighborhood groups in Seattle. Um, where the magic comes is if you can have a person, a biker, pet advocate, or both, who lives in that neighborhood, who participates in the neighborhood group, participates in the neighborhood plan. That's what they do. Schools. Um, all of you have heard of Safe Routes to School. There's been a lot of funding directed that way. There will be more funding in the future, I believe, from what I can tell. And so getting involved in your local parent-teacher organization and your Safe Routes to School committee uh, can be an ideal way to promote bicycling and walking. And be, number one, that's where the, where the money seems to be. Uh, but number two is, we all know this, is that if we get kids walking and biking at an early age, um, they're likely to develop lifelong skills that, or habits, I should say, that will carry through to when they're adults. Uh, number six, a bike advisory board. Number seven, a pedestrian advisory board. And uh, if you want, when I'm done here, and you have questions about sort of how to organize a successful bicycle or pedestrian advisory board, we can come back to that later. Uh, landmarks commission, um, uh, construction codes. Um, a lot of times things are just cookie cutters, uh, you know, in terms of looking at projects and programs, both public sector or private sector, and a lot of times uh, there's boards that are put together to review this construction requirements. So this can be a, a fabulous way to get a lot of bicycle and pedestrian uh, improvements. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, that's going to vary community to community, but in some communities being represented on that is very important. If you're a bike or pet advocate and you own a small business, uh, being involved in your chamber can be really critical. Uh, Parks Commission, uh, in many communities the park departments build all the trails, the rail trails, and so again, depending on your your community, this could be a, a really good place to be involved. Uh, a plan review committee. Uh, some communities have citizen groups that review public and private development, and they're taken very, very seriously. This can be a, a good place to spend your time. Uh, number 13, uh, Transportation Plan Citizens Committee. Uh, number 14, Comprehensive Plan Citizens Committee. Uh, many times when a community develops a, a transportation plan, a comprehensive plan, a bike plan, a ped plan, they will, again, like I mentioned earlier, with the Seattle example, is they'll form a local committee that starts and stops with the development of that plan. Uh, that can be a critical place 
for bike and pet advocates to be. Uh, an arts council. Uh, one of the th pleasant surprises I've had is how important an arts council can be in getting good public art into really all projects, and quite often, uh, for example, building bike scenes into projects. Um, I've seen some beautiful artwork that really has the, those themes uh, built into it. Uh, climatic change is really hot right now. And of course, what's the best answer to climatic change? It's walking and bicycling. So if your community has a climatic change task force working on this in any way, uh, this is where you want to be, because this is where a lot of the action is. And I suspect a lot of the funding, uh, it'll be used to shape a lot of our funding decisions in the future. Uh, number 17 is State Routes to School Committee. I alluded to that earlier. Uh, Boulevards and Greenways Committee. Again, depending on your community, uh, it could be that a lot of your great walking and bicycling boulevards and greenways, rail trails, uh, are, uh, have a separate committee that has been put there. Uh, project Task Force. Uh, quite often on new roads, we may have a task force that looks just at a particular development. Rebuilding a road or adding a new road, widening a road, you want to be there. Um, number 20 I threw in here, I thought it was kind of interesting, Sister, Sister Cities Coordination Council. Most communities have sister cities. And quite often these sister cities are places where bicycling walking is in a much better state and participating in that. And bringing people over, bringing other ideas over can uh, give you permission to hopefully copy and emulate some things happening in your sister city. A complete streets committee. Again, this one can be very, very important, especially as communities adopt complete streets resolutions, ordinances, policies, sectors, rules. Um, this, this probably uh, provides the single best opportunity to get bicycling and walking facilities in your community. Uh, Main Street Committee. Um, the Main Street Movement has just taken off across America. And um, if you're doing a Main Street project, uh, almost always it's going to be connected with increasing more, especially more walking, but also bicycling. That's the place you want to be. Uh, green Streets is, is a term that's frequently popping up all over America. And usually it involves redoing the street at some level and making it more walkable and bikeable friendly. Uh, Urban Forestry Committee, I put that on because I just have a passion for urban trees. Uh, I think they're one of the best things that we can do to increase uh, walking and biking, uh, not only from an aesthetic point of view. But they really create an environment that says, slow down. And then finally, uh, uh, at, at the end of the day, you've, you've got your committee of 25. You've infiltrated all the boards and commissions, uh, and now you get to run for city council or county council or even mayor. And uh, uh, I'm delighted to sort of note that two weeks ago uh, we, we elected a new mayor here in Seattle who bikes everywhere. So some exciting times. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to um, and uh, take some questions. OK, thank you, Peter. Thank you. That was great. Um, we do have some time for questions. We've got about 25 minutes. And um, please enter your questions into the box on your screen. And uh, if we run out of time for your question, we'll attempt to answer it and get back to you after the program. Um, let's see. The, the first question that came in to me uh, is from our neighbors down the street in Durham. Uh, the question is, um, in Durham, North Carolina, we have a small but quite vocal group of bicycling advocates who attend meetings and post on listservs. Um, pedestrian interests seem different by nature. Nearly everyone is a pedestrian for at least part of nearly every day, but very few people self-identify as pedestrian. How can we address this asymmetry in advocating for bicycle and pedestrian amenities? Do you have any suggestions sure. for that? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And I, I think it's um, not atypical at all. It's the, it's the kind of... Uh, a question or comment that I, I get from a lot of communities. Uh, I, would, I would just start by saying don't assume that the models that work for the bicyclists are going to be 100% transferable, copyable to the pedestrian area. Um, a lot of it will be, but a lot of it won't. My experience has been that the, the, uh, at least early on in a community, we're just getting going, um, the, the bike people call themselves bicyclists, they're very organized, they know who they are, they know what they want, um, and, and it's easier to focus. Uh, one of the problems with 
the sort of the PED advocacy area is that, first of all, it's a lot more complicated in some ways. It's a lot more inclusive. I think some of the issues are more diverse. And, and it's harder just to identify as a pedestrian advocate. What is easy, though, and I, this is where I would always start, it's, it's very easy to identify as a neighborhood advocate. And well, I'll just go back to the example that I gave a little while ago when I talked about 35 of the neighborhood uh, plans um, having, having uh, parts in their plan where they were identifying needs for pedestrian improvements. Um, it was, it was fun just, just to talk to all the different people, put this together, and go to the neighborhood groups. Uh, none of those folks saw themselves as pedestrian advocates. They all saw themselves as neighborhood advocates. And so, you know, don't change that. Go with that. Um, I would just, you know, my advice would be is go where the energy is, and it doesn't really matter how it's labeled. And so that can be a, a really great way to sort of get into this a little bit through the back door. And then the other two areas that I already mentioned is if it's a school, again, parents don't see themselves as pedestrian advocates, but they see themselves as advocates for their school, for their children. It just happens to be that most of the issues they focus on will be pedestrian, and that's okay. And um, you know, that's, that's where you can see the energy. And then the third one I don't think I've mentioned yet, and that's in the area of, of public transportation. As we all know, every public transportation trip uh, has a has a walking trip or a biking trip on, on both ends of that on, on that bus trip or train trip or whatever the case may be, and so um, a lot of times you'll find that that um, public transport advocates are going to be some of your best friends for making pedestrian and bike improvements. Again, even though they don't call themselves pedestrian advocates, so I, I would go to those three places where the energy is and 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 it, I think the labeling is less important. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we have another question here. Do you, uh, Peter, do you have recommendations for um, influencing new school siting and development to assure bicycle and pedestrian access? That's a tough one. And yeah. I, I, I'll just start out by saying that I haven't always been successful uh, on that one, too. But um, again, you know, there's two parts to that. One is where you site the school, and then number two is the site design. How do you design it once you get there? Um, and there's, there's, this, is, this is an area that we really need to do some more work at a higher level. Uh, quite often, there are state guidelines that, that direct both of those questions that need to be changed, and assumptions about you know, how much land we need, how we use it. Um, quite often, at the, at the district level, there are uh, similar guidelines in terms of locating and designing um, school sites. And, and uh, again, they need to be changed at that level. Uh, my experience has been it's hard to change them on a case-by-case -case level. Uh, they, they tend to kind of stick. Not to say that you shouldn't try, but we need to really change the rules of, of how we do our schools. And um, that's, that's something we're, we're all going to have to tackle in a big way. Uh, over the next couple of years, because it's uh, probably one of the most more important things that that uh, we all need to do if we're going to make safe school, safe routes of school work. I would add an antidote. Um, I have seen uh, successful uh, efforts in in you know in certain communities where they really do get it right, where most of the kids are walking or biking to school, um, and a lot of times it it has to do with changing the basic rules of you need less space. And you don't need all those ball fields. You can share it, you know, where they're sharing agreements with local park departments. Um, also, uh, rethinking uh, the single-story school. Can we go to two and three stories and, you know, build in an elevator so we can uh, handy uh, have all the folks who might need need that need that kind of assistance? Um, and so, really being creative in terms of of working with other agencies and city agencies. But we've got a long ways to go. Okay, um, kind of a different topic here. Uh, how do you suggest engaging transportation engineers um, who might have a kind of different point of view or are uh, risk averse to um, some pedestrian and bicycle improvements? You know, it, it, um, I'm going to give you the, the 
answer that at sort of two different levels. Um, uh, you know, in, in every profession, and, and I, first of all, I would just say I wouldn't overly point my finger at engineers. Um, there are gatekeepers in every profession at every level who can uh, present a, 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 yeah, a closed gate. <laughs> that means you can't go forward. So uh, I'm going I'm to answer this question more generically for all professions because I don't think it's unique to engineers uh, necessarily. But um, when you're looking at social change, it, it comes in two ways. Either you change systems, or usually you do both, and you change individuals. And so um, I, I think you start by doing what I was just suggesting pick your, yourself out of the position of uh, succeed or fail based on having to change one or two or three gatekeepers' minds. Um, if, if you sort of give permission to two or three people to call all the shots, then you're really setting yourself up for a failure if they don't come around. That doesn't mean the individuals aren't important. I just talked about champions. But don't, don't rest your strategy on having to change one or two people's minds. Um, you know, do the institutional things, do the, all the um, ubiquitous things that I described earlier so the whole system starts to change uh, and then it pulls everybody along. Having said that, um, I, I'll, just, I'll just tell one little story. Um, this was many years ago on a different job, uh, a couple jobs back, but we did have a person who always got it wrong. Um, gatekeeper, important position, no matter what the decision, would always get it wrong when it came to walking and bicycling and there was a certain amount of frustration and nothing had seemed to work and so I came up with the idea and said, well, why don't we give this person an award? And, um, and uh, I had, I had um, so we, it took us some time to find one thing that we liked, but nonetheless, annual dinner, and, uh, and I got the idea sort of from the Wizard of Oz, and you, know, you give, give people what they need most. And found the one, one thing that we all agreed we liked. Uh, brought this person up and gave this person a, a, a plaque and an award, and there were 100 people there. And uh, this person was teary-eyed and said, you know, I've never, never received an award before. Uh, and probably rightfully so, but nonetheless. Um, it, it completely changed. Um, that relationship. Now that doesn't always work, but uh, I do. I do believe that as human beings, we re, we, we respond to um, uh, pats on the back and to recognition. And uh, so, just an anecdote of, of one, one one little story of something that worked one time. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a question about. Um uh, another group to engage, uh, as we increasingly recognize the impacts of a lack of physical activity and the roles walking and biking can easily play in encouraging more physical activity, should we add public health department boards to the list of those worth joining? Do you have some Absolutely. experience engaging them? Yeah, and, and I would say there's, and that was really an oversight of mine. I should have had them near the, hop, near the top of the list. Um, the, the, the public health can be involved in two ways. One is the, the various you know, public health has, that has, depending what your community you're in, a variety of boards and things that you can serve on, which can be very, very important. Um, the other thing that I've seen a lot of, and I think this is really effective, is where people from the public health community uh, get involved in some of these other boards and commissions, the, the, one, the 25 or so that I listed, um, uh, where that voice uh, public health voice coming from a bicycle and pedestrian perspective and a health perspective gets involved. And I think it gives that voice uh, some more authority, some legitimacy, and can be extremely important. And uh, uh, that is, you know, one of the things I have noticed as I go around the country and, and do take courses on transportation or involved in various things is that um, more often than not now, there's a person from the public health community that's there. And uh, it's good, and I would encourage that. OK. Um, this one uh, is more about advocacy strategies. Um, what are the uh, principal economic arguments advocates should be using to advance walkable, livable communities? Um, yeah, I think um, 
I think that's a really good question. And um, I'm just, I'm just going to tell a little story that uh, something I did uh, a long time ago, and I, but I think it, it can be applicable now. Um, when, when I first moved to Seattle, and I didn't know Seattle very well, I was looking to rent an apartment. And virtually every ad on the north end of Seattle said near the Bergman Trail. And being a bicyclist, my wife and I, um, we would run over there, and of course, no trail. And this went on for a week while we were looking at apartments. And I finally figured out what this trail was, and I discovered that anything on the north end of Seattle was advertised as being on or near the Bergman Trail. And then out of that experience, a few years later, um, I did a study called Evaluation of the Bergman Trail on Property Values and Crime. And one of the things that we did is, and this is something you can do very, very easily, is simply go through the newspaper every day uh, or go through the weekly real estate ads, or nowadays you can go on the internet and look at the, at the, at the ads, and uh, cut and paste, print, clip, um, all the ads that mention being near a trail, uh, being near a bus stop, being near uh, a park, some public amenity. And uh, we, we did a whole bunch of other work, but the, the power of just having those to show uh, how important they were for, for moving real estate uh, when we presented that to decision makers was, was very, very powerful. We were, uh, and then more recently, we're finding that that uh, businesses are advertising office space, warehouse space, uh, industrial parks, you name it, as being near the trail, on this trail, whatever the case may be. And it really gets back to what we're discovering now in, in, in the world of economics is that most, or many I should say, <clears throat> many companies today are incredibly mobile. And they're going to go to those locations in part where they can get a quality workforce. And those communities that have the reputation for being great places to live, and almost always that means walking and biking opportunities, are those communities where businesses are going to want to locate. And uh, so I think the arguments for linking bicycling and walking and livable communities to economic development. Um, I think those links are simply going to get stronger and stronger in the future. Yeah, now, um, Peter, uh, in your talk you mentioned uh, you might be able to offer some advice on organizing successful bike and pedestrian advisory boards. And we have a question here um, that asks, what is the best way to structure a government-sponsored pedestrian advisory commission? What responsibilities should they have, and what are appropriate issues for staff to bring to a pedestrian advisory commission? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll hit on a, a few highlights there. Um, I think number one, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> is that it's critical that the the um, I'll say the board that means either bike or ped that the board um, look like the community. In other words. You don't, if you are a, a bike board, you don't want to have everybody the same age in Lycra who likes to go fast. Because then the people, the decision makers can dismiss you as being, you know, you're 2% of the population. But we know that close to 100% of the population walks, and we know that close to 50%, 40 to 50% bikes. And so to be inclusive, and represent all those people, your board needs to look like the community. Um, and in, a, in addition to the kinds of diversity we usually mention, I think it's also important to have some lifestyle diversity. In other words, we need people who walk a lot and walk very little, people who um, have a disability, people who have kids, uh, people who bike only on sunny Sundays in the summertime with their kids in a trailer to people who, that's all they do is bike. And um, so I, I think that's the first part of success. Then the, the second question becomes, how do, you, how do you get the right people on the board so that you create that? And one of, one of the things that, that I found over time is that you want to make getting on a bike or bed board 
a really big deal. You know, have it have the person, uh, him or her, appointed by the mayor, the city, you know, confirmed by the city council, the city manager, whatever the case may be, and make it a big deal. So if you want to be on the board, you send a resume, you you uh, go to an interview, and uh, it is a big deal. Um, one one of the things that I've I've sort of discovered over time too is that you you really want to be able to uh, appoint people. In other words, don't just send a letter out and say, uh, "Would your organization send somebody?" Um, because what you're going to end up doing is end up with the same ten professional volunteers that have always been involved, and you're probably not going to get the kind of diversity uh, and public representation that I was just talking about. So. Uh, usually what I recommend is that you have, say, for example, you might have the chair of the current board, you might have a staff member, and you might have a representative from, say, the mayor's office or somebody doing the interviews. And uh, usually what I just look for, I'd say, okay, we've got 20 minutes, I've got four questions. Here's question number one. You know, why do you want to be on the board? And if the person talks for 20 minutes, they go, thank you very much, because you've just been told there's four questions in 20 minutes, and obviously they're looking for a platform to talk. We need people who can talk, but we also need people who can work in a group and listen. Uh, the other thing I look for always is, um, is people who answer that question, why do you want to be on the board, in a way that reflects a commitment to the whole community and not just a backyard issue. If Someone comes in and says, I've been trying to get a stop sign at this corner for 12 years, and I'm going to use this board to get my stop sign. Um, that means that when they get their stop sign or don't get their stop sign, uh, assuming they do, then they're going to disappear. They don't have that broader vision for what's the stop sign policy for the whole city, for example. And, and so you really want people with that commitment. And then the other thing I always look for, with some forgiveness here for younger people, is um, you know, what's their history of volunteerism? Because I found that good volunteers generally make good volunteers, and uh, look for look for uh, look for some of that um, kind of commitment. Um, the other part of running a successful bike and ped board uh, is to, is to um, you know, I talked about the diversity and the legitimacy, uh, and the other is just how you run your meetings, and some of the same rules apply there as they would for doing an advocacy group. Uh, assign projects to people, allow people to do a report in, give them credit for the work they do, and also have a public speaker. You have a speaker there, and an important decision for every single meeting. And you know, just those are some of the things that you can uh, do to ensure ongoing engagement and involvement among your members. I could go on about it, but I think that's enough for that. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Peter. And uh, those are some really great questions. And unfortunately, that's um, that is all the time we have for discussion. I apologize to those of you um, who sent some great questions in, and we just didn't get to them today. Um, but um, don't hesitate to contact me, um, and we'll try to answer some of your questions. Maybe we can put you in touch with some other resources. Um, then you can contact me at uh, webinars at hsrc.unc.edu or call me at 919-843-4859. And before we end, um, I want to point you to some r related resources compiled and produced by PBIC. Um, the walkinginfo.org website has a host of information for organizing to address community problems at www.walkinginfo.org slash problems. These recommendations and resources include common problems and solutions, uh, understanding and finding other community stakeholders who can help, uh, strategies for successful organizing, such as we talked about in today's webinar, and uh, some selected real-world case studies and community resources and research. I want to remind you that you will be able to access a recording and transcript of today's program, as well as view a PDF copy of the slide presentation at walkinginfo.org slash webinars. We will post the recording and transcript in about a week. On this page, you will also be able to register for the next Livable Communities webinar, scheduled for Thursday, January 21st, from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., when Charlie Zagir will speak on selection of pedestrian treatments at unsignalized crossings. 
And before that, as I mentioned earlier, PBIC will be co-presenting a webinar with Easter Seals Project Action on Wednesday, December 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time entitled Getting There Together, Supporting Accessible, Sustainable Transportation in Your Community. Should be a good uh, follow-on to today's program. And the link to register for both of these webinars uh, will be found at walkinginfo.org slash webinars. And again, I want to thank our speaker, Peter Lagerway of Tool Design Group. And thanks to all of you for attending today's PBSE Livable Communities webinar. Thanks a lot, and have a great day.